And welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Combining Cardiovascular, Respiratory and Neurobehavioral Endpoints for Efficient Study Design. This is Andy Henton from Inside Scientific and I will be your host for today's event. Our session is sponsored by Data Sciences International and is all about integrating physiological monitoring technologies to collect respiratory, cardiovascular, and neurological endpoints from a single animal subject. First, we will be joined by Dr. Brian Roche, Director of Safety Pharmacology at Charles River Laboratories in Ashland, Ohio. Dr. Roche completed his PhD in cardiovascular physiology at the Ohio State University and following held positions at QTest Labs and Battelle where he began to focus on safety pharmacology and toxicology studies. Today, Dr. Roche will present an evaluation of the LA restraint technology utilized in DSI respiratory solutions versus other commonly used methods. Complemented with implantable telemetry, Dr. Roche will show how he has examined the effects of each method on various cardiopulmonary parameters and discuss the benefits and challenges associated with the use of the LA restraint. Following, we will hear from Jason Pacer, Senior Scientist in the Safety Pharmacology Unit at Glasgow Smith Klein in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. Jason completed his bachelor's degree in biology at Penn State University and following held a research position with Bristol Myers Squibb in their oncology research department. For the last 10 years, however, he has been at GSK where his research has been focused mainly on cardiovascular safety testing, including pre-candidate selection, first time in human studies, the application of ECG and arrhythmia analysis, and employing isolated cardiac and vascular assays. Today, Jason will present his assessment of a novel rodent model that examines cardiovascular, respiratory, and neurobehavioral endpoints simultaneously. He will discuss the surgical feasibility of this model and thoughts on consistency and reliability when measuring multiple physiological endpoints. Great, thanks all for participating in the webinar today. Uh, the title of this presentation is Combining Plasmography, Telemetry, and LA Restraint Technology for Use in Safety Pharmacology and Inhalation Toxicology Environments. <coughs> in way of an agenda, what we did, we, we did a bunch of um, small studies within, I guess, the large study in the sense that we looked at the LA Restraint Technology as a whole and the acclimation process of the rat to the LA Restraint. We additionally used DSI's uh, HDS21 telemetry transmitter in combination with the LA restraint and nose only cone restraint tubes to determine if, how the animals acclimate to both restraints. Additionally, we looked at plasmography, respiratory and telemetry in combination using the LA restraint technology and head out um, restraint. We looked at the hemodynamic response, respiratory functional response, and because we had flow um, and tidal volume in combination with a pressure catheter in the pleural cavity, we were able to calculate resistance and compliance. And lastly, we looked at collecting respiratory data on an inhalation study using dosimetry approaches there with the LA restraint. And lastly, we'll finish up with a couple of slides about what we learned from conducting these pilot studies. So if we get into the process of the LA restraint acclimation, um, the, the system is actually built up um, starting with a lay restraint tube in which the rat will be restrained in this tube with this neck clip. Um, and these neck clips come in different sizes based on the size of the rat. Um, and then we'll place on the, the plasmography bell, which will allow us to collect that respiratory data. And then the nose seal. And the seal is actually inside here around the nose of, and mouth of the rat as this nose seal is applied to the restraint tube. So I used a, a prop here to allow us to visually see what was going on with the acclimation process. And it started out um, quite basic in the sense that we took the restraint sled and applied it to the animal's whole cage. Um, allowed the rat for several days to, to move through and about this tube, get used to crawling inside there because the important piece is we want this rat to be in here and be comfortable when we start to, the restraint process. So after that, we removed both the restraint tube and the rat from the home cage and then just held it in place as you see here with the head and neck in position within the tube and understanding that the neck clip will fit into this hole here allowing the, the rat to freely extend its neck through the portion with which we want to restrain. So again this process was critical in the sense of orientating the rat to the position we want them in but allowing us also to, to get a feel for how that neck 
clip is going to fit over the top of the rat as it extends its neck through. So as you can see here, we've actually got the rat restrained in the tube where we want it to be, and it's extending its neck through the, the outside of the tube. The neck clip, right, the, the blue clip here, is already held in place as the rat is inside the tube and extending through. There are different sizes I mentioned of this clip based on the size of the rat. And as it extends through, the, rat, the clip is then just simply um, inserted over the top of the animal's neck. And again, this process, you, taking its time, both from a technical aspect and from the rat's perspective, we want to, wanted to make sure that the neck clip was the right size. Once placed on, the rat will then try to pull back. If it's, if it's too large, then obviously the rat will just pull its head straight through. If it's in between, in the sense that it's not fully, completely over the top of the rat's neck, or it's just large enough where you feel it's snug, but, but the rat is still able to pull its neck through, we noticed that that provided some negative feedback to the rat, slowed the process down in the sense that we actually had to just re return the rat to its home cage and come back and start over. When the neck seal fits um, nicely, the rat won't be able to pull back. It, it might restrain, um, resist the restraint for a moment, but start to acclimate to this process. So here you see the rat in the sense of um, with no movement, the clip over the top, no, no, no neck, excuse me, no nose seal or plasmography bell applied yet, but just the rat acclimated to this process uh, manually held in this step. So as you start to build your studies, right, we're talking about a bunch of different studies that we can use the LA restraint technology for. In the sense of collecting respiratory data, we need the plasmography bell on the back end. So we started acclimating to that process, uh, again, for orientation of where the tail is, but also understanding that the rat will need time to thermoregulate with no bias flow in this, this portion of the chamber. As you can see here, the neck seal is not in all the way. Again, you need the nose seal to be able to do that. So to put it all together, the nose seal is applied. In our sense, we we're looking for respiratory data, so we wanted to make sure the mouth and nose were, were nicely fit over the center of that opening for the seal to, to create the ability to collect respiratory data, but also so that the, the, the actual nose seal itself comes over the top of the neck clip holding the animal in place. So here it is again all together. You've got a nice seal of the nose. The nose seal itself is holding down the neck clip and the plasmography bell allowing us to collect um, the, the movement of the thorax, again, restrained from the neck clip. So once we're in this process, the acclimation grew from here, right? So we, we went, I think, in 15-minute intervals at the start out through um, hourly intervals, and we actually went through the duration of the study, so they restrained up to five hours in this process. So once the animals were acclimated to the LA restraint device, we then conducted a study using hemodynamic data from our telemetry to combine um, LA restraint versus nose-only data. So again, just to bring you orientating to the devices, here's the LA restraint here on the left. Here's the traditional nose-only uh, restraint device on the right. So from a heart rate perspective, we went in three different sessions, 30 minutes, 90 minutes, out to 120 minutes in this study. And from a heart rate perspective, we saw a little bit of a change with the LA restraint being a little bit calmer at the initiation of restraint, but not real much, really much going on as far as the difference between the two types of restraints, particularly, particularly when we're looking at the different types of um, sessions in the sense that this was the second session and here was the final session of acclimation. There was no change in blood pressure over the course of the two hours between the two different devices. And there was a slight change in body temperature, which we anticipated based on the position of the, the rat's tail being inside a, a closed container versus freely um, open up to ambient conditions. So again, we compared to nose-only restraint, and it looked to be very comparable. So then we tried to combine respiratory and telemetry data together in the LA restraint device versus the, the head-out restraint device. And here we were, again, comparing hemodynamic data now that we've got the plasmography bell on, um, we're collecting respiratory function. Because the telemetry unit had um, arterial pressure and pleural pressure, the system was able to calculate the lung resistance and compliance. So for orientation, we've got the lay restraint here again on the left, and now we're comparing it against the DSI Legacy head out plasmography chamber. 
So if we look at hemodynamic data first, we saw a nice reduction in heart rate for the allay restraint compared to the head out method. Um, and this you know, was quite significant through the first 60 minutes of acclimation or restraint in this case, through 120. We didn't see any change in systolic blood pressure over the two hours of restraint, but we did see a slight reduction in diastolic blood pressure. So a little bit more relaxed. And then when you get the product of the two, there was the same reduction in mean arterial pressure. From a body temperature standpoint, now we're comparing apples to apples, right? We've got an enclosed tail in the LA restraint. And we have an enclosed tail in the head out plasmography chamber. So we saw very similar body temperature. Um, if anything, slight titch, maybe one-tenth of a degree decrease for LA restraint. With regard to respiratory function, we saw a nice reduction in respiratory rate, about 50 breaths per, per minute um, in the LA restraint versus the head out plasmography chamber. And, you know, we saw a little dip here. We'll get to that a little bit at the end when we look at um, what's going on. But I, this is where the, the, the nose seal itself might have been disrupted and we lost some data points. With the decrease in respiratory rate, we did see the compensatory increase in tidal volume which was nice to see with the LA restraint. Again, here's the nose, I mean the head out plasmography data. And then from a respiratory function, you know, very efficient system with the LA restraint because at, in the end for the size rat, the minute volume was unchanged. Now we understand we didn't dose these animals with anything that would affect um, lung compliance or resistance, but because it could be calculated the way we had it set up for the main portion of the study, um, we were able to compare the two, and then from a resistance standpoint, you do see some outliers here with the LA restraint, but again, it had to do with the no-seal um, disrupted, causing data to, to jump around. So finally, we looked at dosimetry, or respiratory collection, with inhalation studies using the LA plasmography. So you can see here, again, we've got the rat positioned within um, the restraint tube connected with the inhalation port for the LA restraint device along with the plasmography bell. So again, if you were running an inhalation study only and you wanted to dose through this restraint device without having the, the animal like with a with a plunger type system compacting the thorax, here you know you would just remove the plasmography bell and dose. In our collection here, we wanted to know what the actual minute volume was of this rat, so we collected respiratory data along with the inhalation uh, dosing. Additionally, you can use this um, type of setup, as we see here, because we had the animals instrumented with telemetry devices, you can also look at um, just simply putting a telemetry receiver in combination to allow us to collect, um, again, because of that pleural pressure, the calculations can be done with the, the acquisition system to calculate resistance and compliance along with your respiratory rate and tidal volume. And due to adequate separation, having the animals on the lower end of the tower, we didn't see much crosstalk at all. Um, it was a very nice setup. So we've got a couple of slides about what we've learned about these pilot studies that we conducted for, for conducting, um, I guess, studies for clients and or looking at dosing um, test articles in the sense that the ability to combine inhalation and dosimetry was very nice in the sense that we had the ability to compare to nose only cone, right? And also with head out chamber, in this device, you're able to combine the two. So a very nice setup, again, with both inhalation and dosimetry. It was potentially less stressful to the animal, again, comparing the nose only and the head out based on hemodynamic response. The plasmography system, again, with the neck clip, doesn't restrain the animal from um, thoracic expansion. And we saw that nice reduction in heart rate and increase in tidal volume when we compared it to the, the head out method. Um, as you saw in the inhalation tower, there was a very nice seal. Although the size of the lay restraint is, is larger um, and might feel a little bit heavy, that nice tight seal placed on the inhalation tower um, worked very well to hold, again, with that outer ring, hold the weight and the size of the LA restraint. I didn't show it in this presentation, but there was a spacing collar provided by DSI that as you place the plasmography chamber and the nose seal 
in combination for the OA restraint onto the inhalation tower, there's a chance for you'll keep compressing the two points, um, both the plasmography bell and or the nose seal. So there's a spacing collar that goes on the front end to prevent from placing that nose seal too close onto the animal's face. I mentioned too, with the head out chamber, the seal that's placed around the rat is around the animal's neck, which allows you to collect the respiratory data. And in this setup, the, the restraint is over the top of the neck and there's no physical obstruction against the throat. And you might have seen it in the in the figure that there's a dual chamber on the back of the plosomography valve, and that reduces the variability of ambient changes in the um, environment with which you're collecting. And again, comparing that to the head out chamber. Some of the things we did learn um, throughout these studies were that the nose seal um, placed over the mouth and nose of the rat, because again, you're placing the nose seal on to the restraint sled, the position of that is important. If it doesn't line up correctly, the rat could get a hold of it and you know bite into it or reduce the ability for that seal to work properly and, and you lose some data. Um, I will say that that's replaceable, but to get to it, you need to actually remove the nose seal. So if you're doing an inhalation study, you need to remove it from the tower, remove the nose seal. There's four set screws on the inside of that nose seal that need to be removed, and then you can replace the nose seal. In our experience, we, that happened several times, and we did lose, I think, up to six to eight minutes each time we tried to replace that um, of data. The acclimation process on the front end is time consuming, and, and I don't mean once the animal gets to the restraint portion where you can start building up your time for study. I mean the time before that we are really working with both the technical staff getting used to the device and the animal and the, the the actual animal getting used to the device and the, and the technical staff. So those front pieces um, allowing the rat to get orientated to the device helped in the long run, even though it appeared to be a little bit more time consuming. From a design standpoint, although I mentioned earlier, it felt a little bit heavy, it felt it worked really nice with the inhalation tower that we had and, we, and um, I think a pretty standard. Um, I showed in the presentation the DSI representation of the, the LA restraint had um, feet attached to the the plasmography bell, allowing it to stay stationary. The actual ones that we used on study were were cylindrical. There were no feet, so during the acclimation, um, not mounted on a a um, inhalation tower, they rolled. So again, something to think about while you're doing that acclimation process. And lastly, you might have seen where the position of the pneumatac and transducer ports were based in orientation once you place the rat in the system, whether it be for respiratory studies and or inhalation studies, in the sense that if they're not up around 10 or 2 o'clock um, based on looking at a circular clock, then, you know, as urine collects, it might get into one of the ports if they're, if they're down around 6 o'clock on the clock, again, as a reference point, and or the tail sweeping through some of that and sticking the tail into the ports. Again, things that you might not think happen, but they certainly do, and they did a few times on this the assessments that we were conducting. So again, that, that was um, a lot of information based on combining a lot of technologies, but we found it to work quite nicely um, as we progressed. I'd like to thank Brian for his uh, presentation on a, a new restrained model in the rats. Um, I'd like to go in a different direction uh, looking at combining cardiovascular, respiratory, and CNS um, telemetry in the conscious unrestrained rat, uh, utilizing tool compounds caffeine as a positive control and chlorpromazine as a negative control uh, following oral administration. So there's a little bit of a background. Historically, rodents have focused on a single physiological system when looking at them preclinically, whether it's respiratory, cardiovascular, uh, CNS, what have you. Um, however, we, we believe the integration of multiple systems um, would allow for um, identification of potential effects in these systems much quicker, as well as understanding the mechanistic um, mechanisms behind any functional changes we see in any of them. See this would allow us to drive mechanistic studies focused directly on what we need to look at, uh, allowing us to, to impact um, project teams and reduce attrition. 
Um, in recent years, we've seen combined models in larger animals, such as dogs and primates, using jet or empty jacketed models. However, we haven't been able to do this in the rodent until the recent release of the uh, HDS21 implant from DSI. So the first thing we had to do is we had to surgically implant the, the new implants into the rodents. Um, it is a dual pressure catheter. Uh, with uh, two pressure-sensitive catheters and two biopotential leads on the implant itself. Uh, the first lead that we found uh, to be the best implant would be the cardiovascular. Uh, we found that success or failure of the model generally relied heavily on the cardiovascular. Um, if this surgery was going to be a failure, it was going to be due to this. Um, after we would implant this catheter into the abdominal aorta, uh, caudal the renal bifurcation, uh, using vet bond to glue it into place. After we were able to do this, allow that to set and secure the implant, we would then move on to the respiratory catheter. We implanted the respiratory catheter under the serosal surface of the esophagus and then advanced it into the thoracic cavity prior to securing the catheter with suture. After that, we implanted our biopotential leads into a lead two configuration and then closed up the animal. Success for this surgery was approximately the same as any other uh, CV implantation between 70 and 80 percent. Um, recovery time for the procedure was about the same as you would expect for any other CV or respiratory model. Uh, 10 to 14 days, sutures were able to come out. Animals look great. We did give animals a month of recovery time to make sure that uh, the respiratory catheter uh, and, the, and the incision there were able to heal no scar tissue, and we had a quality, stable respiratory signal. So the study design, and we ran this as two separate studies. Uh, both studies were four by four Latin square crossovers with seven days between each treatment for washout. Uh, we utilized male rats. Uh, the strain was Wister Hahn, uh, and they were implemented uh, with these devices, and we collected arterial pressures, heart rate, ECG, respiratory rate, respiratory pressure, activity, and core body temperature. For the caffeine, each rat received an oral dose of vehicle, which was distilled water, as well as 3, 12, and 24 milligrams per kilogram. For the chlorpromazine, each rat received an oral dose of vehicle, again, distilled water, as well as 2, 8, and 16 milligrams per kilogram. And then we collected uh, continuously two hours prior to dosing, up to 24 hours post-dose to check for uh, reversibility. Uh, we collected minute means, and we used ponema, uh, DSI's uh, Ponema Physiological Platform P3 as our collection suite. So to orient you on the graphs for this graph and all the following graphs, the top graph is going to be absolute values. The bottom graph is going to be changed from pre-dose. The x-axis is going to be time after dosing and hours. The y-axis is going to be our parameter uh, that we're measuring, and the zero time point is going to be the two-hour pre-dose mean together into one time point. So looking at heart rate with caffeine, we see a nice dose-dependent increase in heart rate for the first two hours post-dose. Increase was almost 20%. Looking at respiratory rate, again, we see a really nice dose-dependent increase in respiratory rate at all dose levels for the first two hours post-dose. Uh, almost 55% in this case. Looking at respiratory pressure, we didn't see any statistical significant changes at any dose level here at any point in time. Activity, of course, we see a nice uh, dose-dependent increase again in activity for the first three hours post-dose before it returns to baseline. Now, as an aside, how did we measure activity? So prior to actually running these studies, we ran a couple of pilots looking at various ways to collect activity. Um, what we did was we looked at a light box. If you're not familiar with what a light box is, it looks something like this, where there's beams that shoot across it. And as the animal moves, it'll break beams and, and record activity. Um, we also used the actual uh, implant itself um, has an activity module, and we wanted to see how that compared to the light box and see how accurate it was. We also hooked up cameras to, to monitor these rats, and 
over several hours we would, we would record and then I would manually go back and, and visually inspect and mark down movements of the animals and I would compare it to both the light box and the DSI activity collections and, and see which one was most accurate and surprisingly it ended up being that the DSI module was just as accurate as the light box if not a little more in detecting movement. The one thing that, that it did not do very well at was detect rearing events um, but I have seen other uh, light boxes that have started to look at rearing and being able to record those. Those are something to consider in the future. Finally, looking at body temperature, you know, with the increase in activity, obviously we saw a slight increase in, in body temperature and the high and mid doses um, for the first two hours post those up to about a degree increase in change. So this is great. Our positive control looks good. We saw all of our expected changes in, in heart rate, respiratory rate, um, activity, looking good. And then we got to our negative control and things did not go as planned. So looking at heart rate, we saw um, an unexpected increase in heart rate in the high and mid doses between hours one and eight post dose. Um, to note, I should have mentioned this earlier, uh, the nighttime cycle in, in the room for the rodents uh, lies between hours nine and 21 on these graphs. So we see this increase in heart rate when the lights are on and the animals are actually not really active at this point. Now looking at respiratory rate, we were expecting to see a decrease and unfortunately we saw nothing at all. This was, this was extremely unexpected at any dose level. Respiratory pressure, uh, we don't see anything immediately post-dose, but if you look at the, uh, the data a little further, especially the high dose in green here, we do notice a little bit of depression once we get to the nighttime hours when the rats are active. Uh, it's, it's a little bit depressed from the vehicle. And this potentially uh, indicates a flaw in our study to a little later. Activity, again, we don't see any changes immediately post-dose, but again, the rats are sleeping at this point, so I'm not expecting a big change. And we do see a slight depression once the animals become active at night. Finally, temperature, and temperature tells us that, uh, you know, another indication of we might have had a flaw in our study design here. We see a, a small change of about a degree in temperature, uh, dose-dependent, between hours one all the way out to almost 14, um, showing that the rat was not able to, to bioregulate as well as if it had not been dosed. So something was happening, we just couldn't pick it up in those first couple hours with our other parameters. So again, caffeine showed us the expected results we wanted, chlorpromazine showed us almost nothing that we were expecting. So why did it show us nothing we were expecting? Well, I believe that we should have probably changed our dosing regimen and not dosed at the same time of day for both compounds. We probably should have shifted our chlorpromazine dosing closer to, you know, six o'clock when, when lights go out. This would have at least, if there were small changes, we would have had a better uh, chance of picking those changes up. Also, um, compound that we selected was something that, that Chlorpromazine was not necessarily the first compound that we tried using. Um, we tried fentanyl at first, and it was too potent, and we were not able to, to fully run an, an experiment with it. So the conclusions that we had, it's a very surgically feasible model. Uh, success is right where you would expect for cardiovascular or respiratory surgery. Um, looking at respiratory data, however, so we're collecting continuously 24 hours post-dose, two hours pre-dose, it's 26 hours of data, continuous measurements, um, very time consuming, the rat is not restrained, so it is moving around, it is shifting, bending, you know, it, it's doing all sorts of things that you don't see when you're using a restrained model, and because of that you get a lot of variation in your signal, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of time to filter through the data to, to try and get what you want to get and, and in, a, in an efficient time, efficient manner. 
Um, we had reliable results for the positive control, we, and, and the negative control is going to be a work in progress. We still need to be able to do that. Um, what I would say is that the model is very flexible. So let's say we did see a change in, in respiratory uh, function. Uh, we could take that same rat that we dosed and do a whole new study putting it into a Buxco chamber, a enclosed chamber, um, still collect cardiovascular measurements, and now it's in an enclosed chamber with a transducer. We're able to pick up uh, resistance, compliance, flows, things like that, or we can put it in an alley chamber. Um, if you wanted to do more CNS experiments, if you saw changes in activity that you weren't expecting, you can absolutely have video recording at the same time. You can have time points looking at uh, doing functional tests. So it's, it's a very flexible system. This allows us to, to try and incorporate multiple um, systems into our core studies, and then if we see something really go in a different direction very quickly, um, and really following the three R's of using less animals, less compound, reducing attrition. So that, that part was really nice. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the, the former, uh, the recently retired uh, safety farm head, uh, Dr. Dennis Murphy. Um, as a mainly a cardiovascular scientist, the respiratory portion was a little daunting to me. Um, he was able to really help me go through the data, understand the data, try and work with, with what we had and how to get the data to where we needed it to be. With that, I'd like to, to pass it on to Andy and, and start the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Jason, for your interesting presentation and the uh, and sharing the insightful you know conclusions you were able to draw from from that experience. Um, and yes, um, we're going to move uh, on to our Q&A session now. So, a reminder to our audience: <laughs> send in your questions to the questions panel. We're going to get to as many as we can in the time remaining for our webinar today. Um, I'm going to bring uh, Dr. Brian Roche back on to audio. Brian, are you with us? I am. Thanks. Perfect. And we've got an additional um, panelist to join us for our Q&A. Um, I've got Mike Durand with us, Manager of uh, Scientific Applications from Data Sciences International. So, Mike, thanks for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Okay. So, first, first question, um, Brian. Uh, can you please clarify again how the animal is restrained in the chamber using the alley restraint? And maybe just, uh, I think our audience is looking for any tips or tricks that you can share that made this process as smooth as it can be when handling the animal and making sure that everybody can, everything connects together just right. Yeah, sure. I mean, this is a really good question because, you know, the neck clip, you're, you're trying to combine two things, let alone um, adding a rat to the mix. So you've got the restraint sled and the... Um, neck clip that need to fit into that slot. Oh, nice, nice picture. So you need that blue clip to slip into that that slot, and you'll find that with no rat, the the alignment can be off in the sense that it will not fit down all the way to allow the nose seal to fit over the top of it. The nose seal is what holds that in place. So familiarity with that before you even get the rat um, on the restraint sled, and then once the rat is in there, are really working the right size clip to hold in there because again as I mentioned in the presentation if, if you've got any negative feedback to the rat um, cooperation as far as extending through the tube tends to slow down we found that um, removing the rat from the tube and starting over was was actually easier than trying to wait or um, anticipate that the rat would extend its neck through so I think it's important to make sure the neck clip is positioned correctly so that, that not only is the rat restrained but you can get the nose seal over the top of it very good Okay, that's great. Um, next question we had come in uh, ahead of our meeting, and um, uh, we just want to take uh, uh, an opportunity to um, ask if you guys could clarify how um, dual pressure implants are, can be used to collect and derive respiratory endpoints. So we've also gone ahead and just prepared some graphs here. And Jason, I asked maybe that, that you... Um, uh, lead the charge on answering this question. Sure. Um, so for the study that I ran, uh, it was it's it, the one pressure catheter is cardiovascular. It's it's the other pressure catheter we, we put under the cirrhosis layer of the esophagus and we advance it into the thorax. So once it's in the thorax, it's able to detect changes in pressure in the thorax because as, as the you know you get these changes in pressure that drive patient. 
Um, and then from these pressure graphs, we're also able to, to detect uh, respiratory rate um, using using our software. Now, uh, with my study, because it's not in an enclosed environment, I, uh, there's no pneumatech, there's no transducer, I was not able to detect flow, I was not able to detect uh, resistance compliance, um, but again, it's a very flexible model where you can put it into a restrained um, head out plethysmography chamber or the ally uh, chamber or even a, a full body Buxco chamber, let's say, and then you could collect all this data with a flow, um, resistance, compliance, things like that. Okay. Yeah, and Andy, I'd just like to add that the figures that you have up are, are from the um, the assessments you did in the LA restraint, and you know, in that top left channel one respiratory flow. So that's the signal you're collecting with with your respiratory component through the pneumatac. That second channel just below it, the PCRP, that's your pressure from from the exact same surgery that that Jason just described. You know, and then obviously we've got ECG and blood pressure, arterial blood pressure on that that graph below. The right hand figure. That is the derived signal on the top of tidal volume. So it's using both flow on the left, tidal volume on the right, with the pressure that allows the system to calculate the resistance and compliance. But you can clearly see very nice respiratory signals. And again, the difference being here's a restrained animal versus um, Jason's example where he would be using the, the channel 2 PCRP channel for collection of pleural pressure. Yeah, this one here, yeah. Awesome. Very good. No, thanks for that that clarification. That's great. Um, okay. Um, next question. Um, our audience is looking for suggestions how they, how they might approach data analysis um, of respiratory endpoints differently than CV endpoints. Um, for this one, maybe I'll ask Mike. Can you lead the charge on this answer, and perhaps Brian and Jason, and you could follow up and share, you know, your strategies or what you did in the studies that you shared today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Andy. You know, as was well presented today, combination studies are, are gaining popularity for, you know, a variety of reasons, and some of these were presented uh, today by both Dr. Roche and Jason. Uh, the thing to keep in mind, however, is that when combining respiratory applications like these two, cardiovascular and respiratory endpoints, it is important to understand that these, the analysis of these two signal types might have to be treated a little bit differently from one another. You know, cardi cardiovascular signals, for example, are, are in general very stable and very clean. Uh, respiratory signals, on the other hand, regardless if they're obtained from a plethysmograph, a telemetry implant, or some other type of hardware approach, can appear very different. Uh, for example, mo motion artifact, uh, free roaming approaches, even animal grooming and sniffing and exploring can have some type of impact on the quality of a signal. So, you know, the analysis approach from a cardiovascular to a respiratory, uh, uh, you know, version when looking at combination studies may have to vary. Mm -hmm. So it's important to understand that when you're combining these two technologies or these two types of signals, they can't necessarily be treated or analyzed in the same fashion. Uh, I suspect that both uh, Dr. Rocha and Jason have some insight on how they did that with both of their combination studies, and perhaps they can give a little bit more information on some of their best practices that they've been able to uncover. Perfect. Yeah, that's great. Well, Brian, why don't you uh, go first? Yeah, sure. For for the study that we conducted here with the LA restraint, you know, with the acclimation, we were actually looking for um, small changes over short periods of time, right? We were acclimating from 15 minutes out through to five hours. So we bend the data in smaller bins at the the initial onset, and then bend them out further into hourly averages um, later on in the data. So again, you're you're, you're combining hundreds and hundreds of beats to allow you to get that mean signal with an hourly averages versus the smaller bin. So that should be considered to Mike's point with how accurate the system is marking the data if you have a lot of noise and you're only looking for a five minute average. Um, I would also say that in, in freely moving, when you do have the sniffing and the artifacts that go on, it's very difficult for that system to determine peaks and valleys. It will you know, start counting sniffing and not true respiratory cycle. So those things need to be considered when you're analyzing the data. I, I would just say one last point on the studies that we ran where we had um, flow and pressure is understanding, you know, the system is syncing those two up so that they can, in the integrated format through analysis, get the resistance and compliance. So again, a key point when you have that is not only a, key, a nice clean signal, but also um, the syncing of the two signals together. Very good. Um, Jason, how about you? 
Um, we did something very similar in that when we collected our respiratory and cardiovascular data, we, we collected minute means. So when you get uh, an animal that's uh, holding the breath in particular, it really drastically affects your data. So when you're looking at a minute and you have huge pressure, uh, anything over 20, we know that's just, it's not physiologically accurate. So we're, we're able to just take out that one minute out of, out of the hour. And then, then afterwards, once once we review our data and everything looks good, then then we'll average it into an hour. And then when you get that hourly averages, it looks a lot better than than you would think. Although, again, when you're looking when looking through my data, cardiovascular looks very tight, not much standard error. And then when you look at the respiratory, it's not as tight, still looks good, but there's certainly more variability. And that's just because it, it's it's very difficult data to work with, mm -hmm. and um, using filters and 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 kind of mins and maxes, knowing what's physiologically possible and what's not is, is important. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a great, great comprehensive answer from our, our panel. That's great, guys. Um, okay, actually, while I have you, Jason, uh, questions come in from Cindy. Uh, she'd like to know, just, you know, you shared your the conclusions and the, um, what you guys brought out of that study. At this point, are you going to try another negative control besides chlorpromazine or fentanyl? It's something that's in the works. We think we definitely want to shift our dosing time, and we're looking into using a, a potentially different compound. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that actually was brought up uh, at Safety Pharmacology Society was somebody mentioned uh, this the strain of rat that we use is not necessarily um, a very good strain to look at respiratory parameters, and that that's also something we might have to consider looking at a different strain, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Um, uh, I guess, well, this one was directed at Brian, but perhaps we could look at it from both presenters. Um, they'd like to get your thoughts on reproducing this type of experimentation in the mouse model, I guess, first. Is this possible um, uh, for whole body plasmography? Um, uh, and then with the devices that you guys used in these studies. So maybe, Brian, have you done this in mouse? Is it possible? Uh, Mike, if there's a point for you to chime in on product here on this question too, feel free after the guys have shared what they've done. Sure, I, I have done this in mice. It is possible when, if we're talking about respiratory, I've not done combined respiratory with uh, in a pleural pressure. Okay. But from respiratory standpoint, yes, um, very nice signals. Again, things are just reduced down like you would think based on size, based on dead space and that sort of thing, but um, mouse respiratory data is, is quite common. Okay. Jason, yeah, the only thing you? that I would add. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Mike. go ahead, Jason. Please, please, Jason, go ahead. Um, I, I, I do believe DSI has come out with a dual pressure mouse model. It's, it's not the same mm -hmm. as have they? No, you know, I'm not even sure if they have have a dual pressure mouse model. You can't do it in in the rodent in the rat model. It's, it's just too big of an implant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mike, what were what was? Uh... And that was exactly what uh, Jason had just suggested. That you know the, the the approaches, the models of being able to do an interpleural pressure telemetry uh, surgery for a mouse is feasible, but to be able to do a combination of a dual pressure for a for a mouse application with a smaller device is currently not available. Okay, very good. Good to know, um, Jason. Uh, can you just maybe recap at a high level your surgical procedure? Um, I'm going to go back to the graph that you had so that you can sure. reference it. Um, just give me a moment to do so. Okay, I think they should see it now. So, so basically, it's a it's an abdominal incision first uh, from the xiphoid or just just uh, near the xiphoid process down. Uh, First, I would isolate the abdominal aorta. Um, I would locate where the renal bifurcation is, as well as the femoral bifurcation, and my catheter has to go between these two bifurcations. Um, I would clean off the artery. I would get to isolation points, um, put sutures through those isolation points, uh, prep my catheter. Um, we would we would occlude the artery. I'd poke a hole in the in the in the artery. I, I generally use a 22 gauge needle. Uh, and I bend it. Um, once I have a hole in the artery, I, I put the catheter in. I advance it up to the upper occlusion point. Uh, my colleague would drop the suture so I could advance my catheter past that point. 
will then reocclude it. So the suture is now keeping that catheter in place. I'll dry off the artery. I'll glue it down. Um, allow 12 to 14 seconds for that glue to dry. Uh, then we'll drop our sutures. We get blood flow again, per, uh, perfusion. Um, if the if the occlusion takes too long, uh, that's that's usually where you have a problem with the surgery, where you get failure. If if you're having trouble getting the catheter. Uh, advanced, or if you're if you're, sometimes you're not in in the lumen of the vessel, sometimes you end up in intermuscular. Then then you end up with uh, lameness in the legs, and that's when you'd have to euthanize. Once that's done, I would um, go up to towards the stomach. We would actually throw a suture in the in the top portion of the stomach, and using a hemostats, just kind of drag it down. And this really makes the esophagus very prominent. Uh, from there, again, I'll use a 22 gauge needle to, to poke a hole in, in, into the cirrhosal layer of the esophagus. I'll advance the catheter up into the thoracic cavity. I'll, from there, I'll use a suture to actually tie it um, into the musculature of, of the esophagus to keep that catheter in place. Um, we'll take all our sutures out. Everything looks good here. Um, at that point, I would uh, prep my biopotential leads for ECG. Uh, the negative lead I would put under these uh, on the dorsal side of the um, xiphoid process, uh, and that allows for nice shielding. So we're going to get a nice, good, good-sized P wave. Um, from there, I would tunnel up uh, under the skin, uh, up to the neck area of the rodent. I'll close everything up. I make sure I have, you know, I put saline in there. Make sure things are fluid. We don't get any adhesion. Um, and then once everything's closed up, um, I'll, I'll advance the positive electrode under the sternum. Uh, there's a space under the sternum you can get under. Um, and that all allows for a really nice lead to configuration ECG. Suture that up, and the rodent's done. Excellent. I I, I'm sure it does. Actually, that was, it's, it at least sounds to me like that was a very detailed and, and thorough answer. So our, our audience will be happy. And I was going to say, this, it's a good thing we're recording this. <laughs> so uh, awesome. Thanks, Jason. Um, okay, another question. Um, is there any way to collect blood? Um, and I would say, let's parse this out into Brian and your setup and then Jason and yours. So... Uh, Brian, in, in your experiments, uh, uh, you know, are there times in which you can do blood draws from the subjects, and how would you go about doing that, or have you done that? Yeah, and again, with the anesthet, I mean, sorry, the restrained model, it's very easy. So there's, there's a catheter port that we placed in prior to study start, and that externalization of that catheter would be extended through, in my experience, prior to the LA restraint technology, through a port, through a uh, vent in the the actual restraint device to externalize it, and that gives you free access to um, keep it locked and then um, collect samples as needed based on the dosing and the post-dosing intervals. Okay. Great. Uh, Jason, how about you? Yeah, absolutely. If it's a single bleed, you can certainly use tail vein, um, retroorbital bleed, if that's what you, you guys use. Um, if you're looking for more of a chronic um, bleeding, it's it's really hard to recommend it when you're collecting 24-hour cardiovascular data because every time you disrupt the animal, you're going to get changes in heart rate and blood pressure and, mm -hmm. and all sorts of stuff. Um, if if you're looking for more of a chronic um, sampling, I would I would highly recommend you can absolutely um, implant um, a catheter, uh, exteriorize it, put it in a harness, and then and then that way the rat is still unrestrained. It's in a harness, and then you can uh, sample blood that way. Okay, great, great. All right, well, I'm going to say, um, let's ask one more question here. This one's from Matt, and um, it's going back to the subject of thoracic compression as a limitation with the standard head-out uh, technology and how the alley restraint is different. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he's looking maybe for your guys, uh, or Brian specifically, your, your thoughts on is this uh, a, a better way to go about it, in your opinion? So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I really appreciate the question because it gets me to a point that I don't think we really discussed, which I, I did discuss how the restraint works with the neck clip behind the animal's neck, behind the ears, um, or X to expand and contract. If you think about the nose only or even the head out, you know, you need that plunger system to push the animal forward. And the nose only 
in order to get respiratory signal, you actually would need to condense the rat enough that the rat's shoulders and um, back of its neck actually form the seal to collect the respiratory data. In this setup, you've got the nose seal around the animal's mouth, so the, the back half of that portion of that animal is freely moving, meaning um, as if it would be in its home cage. So I think we found nicely in the, in the data set based on head out that respiratory function was um, more efficient in the sense that rate was lower, tidal volume was higher for the same time interval under the same conditions. Perfect. Okay. Um, and Mike, is there anything to add here from you? Yeah, Andy, the only thing I would add there is, you know, some of the study approaches that researchers have is longitudinal in, in nature. So reproducibility of placing an animal in a restraining device of any kind is very critical. So not only being able to get a proper seal to get respiratory endpoints altogether or a proper seal for inhalation exposure studies, the ability for a technician to be able to repeatedly place an animal in and out of a, a chamber of any design consistently uh, adds adds amount of value to it because if there's technician error or inconsistencies on how much you might compress, for example, the rear end of an animal using a plunger style approach, uh, you might get differences in values from one session to the next, all of the things being equal. So the, the, the applying of an LA restraint to where we no longer put that pressure by compromising the thorax from the rear end and, and consistently maintaining a restraint from a neck clip behind the ears and in front of the shoulder blades allows us to minimize some of that impact of potential air just based on a procedural method more so than from a potential drug effect.